Ancocho. Ang chúng tôi nhập ra và to cái chấm ca này tệ vị thì chấm nạc ca tam cao phía địa bàn cùng tục cái chấm nạc ca phía xã đỉnh đầu này đi nâng to ca tăng tung độ đỉnh đầu chấm phu này chấm điền chấm vịt đặc biệt chấm lỡ đời cầm bị tụi cà phê cái đấy cứ cầm bị tụi cà phê cái đấy lục yên giới hay nâng cầm bị tụi cà phê cái đấy lục cứ sầm phòn ai muốn nộp đơn vị thi ca chuẩn từ cầm bị tụi cà phê cái đấy lục yên giới nông ca tăng thông ruộng đánh đào nhập phố xã xây ruộng đi chiếm bản to nốt sông cà lam chi lục đối với là người ca bị dịch thành phía bắc miền nâng áo bắc miền phía kỳ nâng bục cột đại lòng nhầm ra có anh chưa nhỏ chỗ rùm được không cái chậm nạc cả sạm nạc cả đi xong chậm rệp lục bạch thiên cướp phía kỳ tầng o nơi riêng cái đây ní miền bắc miền lược lấy tại chân chọc chọc yên sơn lý miền bắc miền nơi bận tụp không khốn nơi kháng cáo xa sạm nạc cả chân chọc chọc yên sơn lý Tham rồi dạy mê thị vị bỏ quát Bạn xin là xong lẹp bóng sức Mình vô tìm mê đập tốt Nơi chấm phú mục Ông chúng tôi chấm rẻ Xong rạp rồi dạy bê bê mùi thường ngay Nơi thường ngay này Lý khất lẹp bóng sức Rồi bỏ chân chấp cháu Bạn phụ cô đọc làm chi rồi hỏi Xạ xây bóng rong xong rạp xa bà nà ca thường ngay này Cứ xạ xây đầy mê đập hà xa niếm TCW Pram rồi học sức buồn Xạ xây rụp này Nâng mọi đó Ông chúng tôi chấm rẻ Nơi mọi đọc rực này Xong ổn bà ở quận thì làm bầu ní ông chúng ta tham gia lưu tham gia xong robot chúng tôi cho yên sử lý ông chúng ta bàn tập tuôn thì xong robot chúng tôi cho yên sử lý cho thằng này gì mà phải buôn khai cả cái đài cho năm bị phong đào phí tan mà dễ vì tại vì cái cái đây bao quát xong lại bằng sách cho room nông sam na ca để tuôn nông bộ tục sam na ca đi đời nơi tam đan cái chấm na ca sam na ca bị chấm ngái tam mà dễ được phong thảo tuôn tham gia chấp phê đầm na ca phê như mấy thằng này đi và bây giờ mình đã tăng hông đại đạo thuộc một tục vì nên nâng thay toàn tộc hiệp chân chập chào nơi một tí không khen ở vô tổ cố bàn bánh trẻ thai chân chập chào yên dưới đi nơi bật rực ní miền ạc cà rạng hót khá lắng nơi bê phương cho là nà bằng tên chân tui còn bàn phát đo là anu xa thá cua tài trời bàn ảnh ảnh nhát ở nơi tạm đàn cây chậm nạc ở quật nơi tạm đàn cây chậm nạc ca thăm nạc ca phi chậm ngái phi bận tục khăn cà rộng xa mạng ca đâm bây ការធ្វើចលនាអង្គយមរះយល់ឃើញថានៅពេលនេះជនជាប់ចោតអ៊ីងសរីដែលបានលះបងសិទ្ធចូលរួមក្នុងកិច្ចចំណាយការសាម
ខ្ញុំចង់ខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្ញុំខ្
attempt, we were attempting to use all of all of all documents. My dad had our documents that the gentleman has generated. Thirdly, while the issue, while the gentleman has indicated that he is not a demographer, the point of the exercise had I been allowed to do so, although I will attempt to pose some questions in this area, was to show that if you are to look at this evidence, or this, the, uh, the documents that the gentleman has produced, you will find that he cites no authority. And that is the point. The point is that he is simply, I'm entitled to make my record, sir. You can object all you want. He's making assertions without attribution. My question is, he's not a democracy, and he's not an expert, where does he come up with these figures? That's the thrust of my question. And now I'll be more than happy to hear the, the objection. Thank you, Your Honours. Your Honours, this is a, a, a technique that we see repeatedly in this courtroom, which the Chamber has ruled uh, out of order. There is no right to make a record. The record is the transcript. The final word on this should have been the trial chamber's ruling. The counsel should respect that ruling and move on. That may be the case in some instances. However, when we are being publicly chastised for being unprepared, uh, are trying to do things that are inappropriate and what we believe mischaracterize our efforts in trying to help the trial team to get to the truth we feel is our duty and it's a public duty to do with the real people and the 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 ដោយផ្អែកលើមូលដ្ឋាននៃសេចក្តីសម្រេចទាំងឡាយ <coughs> Dr. Chandler, yesterday, you indicated that you read a study on demographics by Patrick Pavolino. I may mispronounce the name. In looking at that particular uh, document, it would appear that it was published somewhere in 1998. Are we referring to the same study? Yes, there's only one that I'm aware of. Now, uh, prior to 1998, on other occasions, សេចក្តីខ្លួនបានជាមួយចំនួនជាមួយសេចក្តីក្នុងឆ្នាំ one in seven, at one point, in 1999, you go 1.5, then at some latter point, you raise it to a million. You also have various estimates of violent deaths, ranging from 100,000 all the way to 400,000. And in looking at your earlier 
publications and even your latter publications, it would appear, but in particular your early ones, that when you come up with these figures, you cite no authority. Yesterday having told us that you're not a demographer, can you please explain to us how it is that you came up with these figures? And for the trials chambers convened, the relevance goes to his methodology as a historian because it calls it the Question, much of his historical work that he's done. So could you please tell us how did you come up with these figures? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I hope that my variety of these figures running from over a million in uh, 1990 before I was able to come back to Cambodia to or between 1.5 and 2 million, the figures I've consistently held since then. These reflect the demographic studies that were available to me when I was writing. I'm sorry I didn't cite those, uh, their, cite those particular studies. They're the same ones I've always used. Uh, estimates have since come up in various documents that I did not uh, and many of these, many of these uh, sources that you're citing, which I can't see, you can't see what they were, and I'm surprised I wasn't allowed to uh, verify, look at this chart at some stage, but uh, you're still referring to it, obviously, uh, were journalistic articles that didn't have footnotes. Other things, uh, I did cite uh, uh, Uveline and uh, also uh, Skrywinski. Uh, I hope that my inconsistency with these figures, which I'm not particularly proud of because these figures are nobody knows these figures. If I had an exact figure, I would certainly use it. These are all estimates. I hope that this doesn't, as you suggest, uh, call into question my uh, historical work in other places because I don't think it does at all. First, let me assure you that I'm not referring to any journalistic uh, opining that you might be making for the press or for public consumption, but rather I'm referring to your scholarly work uh, as a historian. And might I ask, is it a common practice for a historian to make assertions without giving attribution where certain assertions such as figures of this nature come from? Is that part of the scholarly process of the historian, someone the likes of you, who's been coined to be the doyen of Cambodian history? Is that something that you want That's just as well. I probably should uh, have been more controlled. Okay. Um, yes, sometimes it is a practice. Otherwise, historical documents would look like the court order. I, I, could, I could never write a 300-page book with 4,000 footnotes. Uh, I, that's a particular form of historical writing that I don't indulge in. Sometimes when uh, things are... Sometimes I should have cited sources, probably. I'm claiming only on these figures that they reflect things that I've read and the sources that I drew them from were ones that I told you about yesterday. Now, uh, just a couple more questions on this demographic. I don't want to the point. If you're a historian and not a demographer, you're throwing out these figures without us knowing where they come from. And you claim that you have looked at what others have done. You cited one study, which is back in 1998, of an actual demographer. You also cited a gentleman from France who had done an earlier study. What gives you confidence? That, they, that what they produced was actually uh, accurate and reliable if you, in fact, are not a demographer and from what appears from your testimony, you never consulted with them to see what is the process, what sort of sources they use, etc., etc.
Well, the sources for Mr. Levine's study are cited in his uh, article. I wasn't prepared, and I'm never prepared to get in touch with the writer to question his footnotes because I have doubts about his sources. I can't do that with every article I read, or I'd never write anything. Um, I was confident that these two books, uh, I, like the, I like the findings of these two books, the, uh, two, two studies rather, one's an article. Uh, I did not find convincing contradictory evidence from other published sources. Uh, these sources, and as I probably should have said more often than things I've written, and I do regret that, uh, the actual figures will never be known. The, there was a census in 1962 and not another one until 1998 between then. All demographers are operating, and, and other writers, and many other historians have been have wandered into this field besides me, I let, let you say, have been using those two census figures as benchmarks to how to work out what happened between 1970 and 1979. Uh, so this is the best I can do, I'm sorry to say, or happy to say. And do you recall whether Mr. Haveline, what, what was the sources that he used? Do you recall offhand? Not the, no, I do, I do not recall offhand. I would recall, of course, if I saw the article again. I've read it several times in the past, but not recently. And would it surprise you that it was the um, 1992 election was, that was the starting point? Not if you're looking at the document, I certainly wouldn't contradict that. Okay, very well. Uh, let's move on to another topic, and, and we're going to spend probably the majority of our time together on this, which is what you've been telling us here in court. I don't think I will be going into any documents that are not uh, on file or uh, I can call up the page uh, if you think it's necessary, but I'm going to, uh, uh, I want to move as quickly as possible to some of these, uh, these answers that you provided. Uh, and start in, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first day, the first day, and because we don't have the page is lying here all over the place. I will give for the court's convenience to use page number and then the time period where it would be able to find it. At some point, on page 24, this would have been the first day, 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 Time Time 10 10 .1. 1. You were asked about um, the book Pol Pot Plans the Future, and you were asked if you could identify uh, the authors of some certain documents, and, and in that, that uh, you gave us the answer that uh, you could not, other than one particular document, uh, you could not identify who the authors were. Uh, and then you said, said I was making, that that were making a guess at some point. Uh, when you assigned Pol Pot to one particular document itself, do you recall that? Yes. Uh, and when you say I, that, that was a guess, that's an assumption you made as a historian. Yes. And you said that the author of Pol Pot was uh, Chen Yuan. Yes. Later on, on page 26, right above uh, 9.42, you <laughs> indicated that you did not know how many exact copies and the numbers of copies of the circuit documents were being circulated. And then you said that you wanted to say, this is on page 26, line, lines 13 to 16, that it was probably 10 to 15 copies of the 
ai ចំណែកគេសាបដល់ទៅ no, this was not guesswork. Some of the documents contained lists of the people to receive copies. These are the number of people in different documents varies, but it sometimes six, seven, eight, ten in there is a small, very small group. It is not open. It's not, it's not, not an open guess on my part. It's a very limited audience, and often the specific uh, addressees are listed at the end of the document. Right. These are the standing committee things particularly, not, not, uh, we're not talking about the speeches here. Right. Moving on, and, uh, this is more, mostly for clarification you were asked again about the authenticity of those documents, and in particular the decision made by the central committee, as you said, that these are authentic. So again, I want to I'm not kind of force an answer, but it would appear that you say, when you say, I guess, from my conclusion, your conclusion is a guess, is it not? Uh, the problem here, Your Honours, is that the, um, the expert is being given a, a couple of words taken out of context out of a much longer statement he made. And if you look at the page, we're, we're just managing to keep up with our learned friend, but the, the, if he reads the whole quote, it becomes clear that uh, the nature of the professor's uh, conclusion becomes clear. It starts with the words, no, I have no doubts as to its authenticity, and then it conti he continues to explain um, as to how he came to that conclusion. Um, I think it's unhelpful if, if words are taken out of context and a word guess appears here and there um, can convey a completely different um, nature of the answer to that which was given. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to read the entire uh, quote, Mr. President. Um, I am trying to save some time, and we are before professional judges. But let, let's go through your answer. No, I have no doubt as to its authenticity. I don't know where those doubts, how they could be, how they could arise, or how they could be settled. And one could say that these documents are forged. The evidence, I don't know where that, that would come from, the documents, but they're not forged. I don't know where that ever has come from. So my guess is that my conclusion, rather, is that these are authentic documents that survive more or less by chance. Are you not saying that you guess, or, and then you go on to say your conclusion is not your conclusion a guess? I guess that's what I'm trying to get, and I'm trying to get you to clarify this. I think I clarified my use of the word guess by suggesting that it was my conclusion. I don't see where this is leading at all. I, I'm not quite sure I understood that circular answer of yours. So are you saying when you say that that was your conclusion, that your conclusion was a guess? Or was that just a matter of speech? You know, we are in court, and I apologize if this seems to be amusing to you, but this is how it's done. I, I apologize if I seem, I, I'm certainly not uh, amused by some of these things here. I'm, I want to be more serious, and I apologize if I was giving the wrong impression. Uh, 
But the preceding parts of the document were, of the statement, were showing the basis, is, basis of my convictions. I did not say my wobbly conviction is, or geez, maybe just possibly. I changed the word guess as I was talking, as people do when they're talking, as I was doing, not writing. I would never say, I guess, I mean, I conclude in a written work. I could see that the word guess was too loose to describe what I'd said in the previous two minutes. So it was a conclusion, and I stick by that. Thank you, Dr. Chair. And perhaps I should explain that the record is what we're left with, and we don't want to be guessing what you meant by something, and that's why I'm taking this opportunity, and I apologize to everyone if it seems obvious to everyone else, but it doesn't seem obvious to me at times. Later on, on page uh, 30, uh, you were asked a question by Judge Cartwright, and this would be uh, right below 10.13.51. Uh, this is the same documents required between 40 to 870, the party central, and it also refers to the plan to produce three tons of rice and so on and so forth. And then it goes on, the question goes on, in your research, have you been able to establish whether these policies were pursued during the period with which we are concerned down to the middle end of 1976. And if you look at your uh, answers now, which would be the following pages, would be page 31, and it would be right after 10.15.58. You say at some point, uh, is basically one that could be entitled Given the title of the book, Pol Pot plans the future, except, of course, it's just not Pol Pot, the central, gov central governing group of people in the country. It was a collective leadership in the country, so that the title may be a bit catchy, and so on and so forth. And then you go on to say, this is right after 10.16.49, I gathered from the closing order, which I have been reading, that some of these weekly reports are now, have become available by coming into central committee. And I guess here's what I'm trying to get at, and I'm trying to get you to explain to you. On the one hand, you say, that this was a collective leadership, and then you seem to be saying that some of these policies that you're discussing, some of the information at least, is coming from the closing order itself. Am I reading it right? Uh, <clears throat> with respect, I don't think so. I think all I was saying at that point was that the document refers to, uh, I mean, Pol Pot Plans the Future refers to reports are required from the countryside, and I said, now we know that these reports came in. That's a footnote. I didn't cite what the report said, and it wouldn't have altered the uh, first part of the uh, statement to which that refers. It, uh, no, I think, I think it's, and as for the collective leadership, I think I've made that point many, many times, uh, and, but I think a book called The Collective Leadership of Cambodia as Plans to uh, Govern the Country would be an unsellable book, and this I'm, I'm, that's the way books are written, I'm afraid. Pol Pot is still a fair word to use because he was the chair of the Central Committee, and his decisions governed, uh, overrode 
any sure. negative opinions that might, I say, I only say might, but have come up from other members. All right, and we're going to get to that. And that but I, I appreciate that explanation. But then when we go down further, uh, further down, and perhaps I should focus on this part, where you do say, I've gathered from the closing order, which I have been reading, that some of these weekly reports are now, now have become available, are coming into Central Committee. Now, yesterday you told us that you did not have access to the supplementary material that was in the footnotes other than what was provided to you uh, by the trial chamber in preparation for your, uh, for your testimony. He told us that you only read the closing order when you came here and you requested to read it. So if I look at this sentence, are we to conclude that at least with respect to this part of your answer, it is the closing order that is assisting you and not some independent research that you have done years in advance, having access to archive material, hopefully primary sources. Uh, the answer has to be certainly, but the point is, the point I was making in that uh, point was, it's interesting that some of these documents have come in since. That's all I was saying. I was not saying anything else than that. It might not have been, and I was also taking, uh, maybe I should question every sentence in the closing order. I don't have time to do that. I thought it seemed uh, absurd to think that, this, that these documents cited in the back of the book are invented, so I wasn't able to reach them in time, but uh, I accepted that sentence as an amplification of my statement. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chandler, for that answer, because obviously that's what we're here for, because we do challenge the closing order, we do challenge what is being cited at times, and it's our submission that the closing order may contain errors. And that's why I asked whether you had done your due diligence, <laughs> although we know that you did not have access to the documents and that was not your remit before coming here. But suffice it to say, you're relying on the text and you have not checked the documents themselves that support the text to see whether, in fact, what is cited in the closing order drafted by the prosecution then uh, afterwards it was confirmed by the investigative judge after they'd done their so-called investigation, but you did not do your due diligence, did you? Your Honours, not only is counsel testifying and expressing opinion about other phases of these proceedings, um, but he's also asking a question which the professor has now answered at least twice. I'll move on to my next question, uh, Mr. President. ចំណេះក៏បានឆ្លើយពីក្នុងរដ្ឋបាលអាមមួយបានជាមួយនឹងសូមបន្តទៅសំណួរបន្តទៀតលោកប្រធានសូមមិត្តវីរៀបចំន
as the secretary, he certainly thought that Pol Pot had the final word most of the time in the decisions, but from my work and from material I have been reading just very recently and the things and materials that have come out in the closing order, it seems that he was very much on top and engaged in the day-to-day -day policy matters on, on all parts of, Cambodian, of the Cambodian enterprise. Now, let's look at your answer. You, seem to, you say that Pol Pot had the final word most of the time in these decisions. What do you mean by most of the time, and what do you mean by these decisions as opposed to other sorts of decisions? I think I was being prudent to say most of the time because I have no way of saying all of the time. So it was, again, a, a supposition. Uh, I think there's plenty of, of evidence about Nguyen Chia's activities. Many of them have, he's admitted himself in public documents as being a person who was very much involved with the governing of uh, Democratic Cambodia and very much the second person in the chain of command, if you like. Uh, I, when I was saying things that I've read recently, I was not necessarily referring to the evidence in the closing order that I cited, I should have uh, had the, I mean, the passages, and this is all on the first day. I was getting, I must say, I was getting my sea legs. I don't think my testimony was as good as I might have made it later in terms of clarity for, in, for your purposes. I apologize for that. But uh, I was reading, test, had I gone to the back of the book, and I can do that uh, if you like, because I've got the order back in my hotel, I can do it tonight. Uh, I think a lot of these statements about his uh, high authority came from open sources rather than from witness statements who watched him doing this because I think that would be rare. But I'd have to verify that. Okay. Well, uh, Professor Chandler, I'm talking about Paul Pot. I wasn't referring to Nguyen Chia, and I understand that that was a question, but I'm focusing on your segment where you say Paul Pot had the final word. Because as we go through uh, your testimony, you talk about collective decision making, but you also acknowledge that Pol Pot had the final word, and at one point, in fact, you indicated that he could veto whatever was done. And I guess my question to you is, is it your testimony that Pol Pot was not first among equals, but in fact he was number one and could do whatever he, make any decisions he wanted with others who might have been in a particular body would have to go along? Well, that's, that's a good question, a complicated question, and the point is, I think I've, I think I've made this point many times, in collective leadership, and particularly in the uh, leadership of other communist countries, the secretary of the party has the over, he can has the last word, that's it, no one overrides the secretary of the, of the communist party, the secretary of the central committee. No one overrides him. Uh, the decisions reached, this has been characteristic of the uh, CPK throughout its life, are reached following discussions. The standing committee meetings that we have, very small example, shows that in every case there was discussions first, then a final statement by the secretary and the ones we've got, and this was the, obviously the binding uh, statement. So he's first among equals, but he's first. And he is the uh, person in charge. And in public statements, including his uh, public documents, including his uh, autobiography and other places, uh, Nguyen Chi has admitted this repeatedly. This was the man in charge, Pol Pot, of a collective group. And are you, try, are you suggesting, and I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, I'm just really trying to understand your answer. Are you suggesting that in light of Pol Pot's authority and, and power, that he did not or could not make decisions on his own and then impose them as the will of the collective. Well, in the absence of those perhaps 300 standing committee meetings that we don't have, I can't answer that definitively, but I have never seen any evidence from anybody that he, uh, well, that's not quite true. 
long after the, the preview of this trial on occasion uh, in the 1990s. It seems like Pol Pot sometimes made collective leadership and disbanded. It, was, it, it uh, so made some decisions on his own. During the PK period, the DK period, we have no evidence that this ever happened. Uh, there's no evidence that the uh, standing committee was not, uh, most cases, cohesive. I say most cases because some of them were uh, taken away and, and uh, executed. But certainly there's no evidence that there was any public disagreement uh, that he uh, overrode with a singular decision. The atmosphere was collegial. This was a, a place where I think he was given this authority, but I don't have the evidence that he ever used a one-man authority to override the collective view of all his committee. Uh, and I, I also think also that had that ever happened, uh, some serious events would have happened inside the committee, but that is an assumption. Well, you're assuming that there was 300 and some meetings. Are you not? Do you have the documentary evidence to show that these meetings actually occurred as they were scheduled or planned or projected to occur? Or are you just throwing that out there? I'm sorry, I'm not throwing anything out there. Uh, these documents, I do not know that the meetings for which we have these documents occurred. How can we know that without having been there in 1975? Okay. Uh, they, well, let me finish. It's my red light. The uh, documents, there are other documents that suggest that say these meetings took place on a weekly basis. We have eight of them. Playing out, you think. A weekly basis, three years, you get some kind of a figure. I've never decided exactly what it was, but there were many, many meetings of the standing committee. That, um, that's an assumption. Uh, there's no assumption. I, I think it would be uh, absolutely idi idiotic to think that the eight the seven or eight documents that we've uh, inherited for the uh, for the, our investigations were the only standing committees that ever meetings that ever occurred. There's evidence that there were other standing committee meetings for which we don't have reports. And is it your evidence, sir? Is it your evidence that all members attended, all members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings? All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing committee meetings. All members of the standing committee attended all standing Perhaps it was uh, an uh, Are you suggesting from your uh, answer uh, that all standing committee members were attending all meetings? Uh, I'm not sure I wouldn't be, uh, no, that would, be, that would not be a good suggestion. But but before, in your question, you made a suggestion that was made uh, in another question I've had in this uh, thing. What, what happened at these meetings we know nothing about. Now, how can I tell you what happened at the meetings we know nothing about? I don't know who was there. I don't know how complete it was. The evidence we have is that the standing committee is a small group. I would say probably most of the members or all of the members came to the meetings because that's what they were supposed to do. That was their main job. But saying that all of them attended all of the meetings, I'm, of course, completely uh, have no reason to say that. That's what we're trying to get at, uh, Dr. Chandler. We're trying to get as close to what your actual knowledge is. And when you are making conclusions to see what the basis of your conclusions are, uh, do you know whether all the members of the standing, standing committee attended uh, all uh, discussions that were tabled before or by uh, Pol Pot? I would have to review those 15 documents. I think sometimes there were some people absent, but Usually it was the full attendance. It could in fact be the full attendance, but I don't have those 15 documents in front of me. Aside from those 15 documents, 
Evidence that you don't have, but are you prepared to say that Pol Pot insisted or included all members of the standing committee on all topics that he was discussing at that higher level? I have no way of saying that, and also I'm surprised that you're asking me to give evidence for which I have no evidence. I mean, this is what you've been accusing my historical methodology. You want me to go into my sort of modus operandi, which is talking with no evidence, or what? No, I just want an answer, sir. Well, I'm trying to make a record. I'm trying to make a record. Let me go back to um, this whole answer where you say you, you try to uh, answer part of it. I've, I've been reading just very recently material. Uh, what is this material that you've been reading very recently? And then you say, and the things and materials that have come out in the closing order. So we have two things, material that you have been reading very recently, hence my questioning about Heather, and whether Heather has been communicating with you recently and about providing you information, uh, documents, not necessarily for, for your testimony, but just uh, for academic purposes. So that's one part, and the other part is, when you say the closing order, you've told us you've had no material related to the closing order other than that was what was provided to you. So again, are you, are you relying on the text of the closing order? And what, are, what, and what is all this material you're talking about? So we can do our due diligence. Can you elaborate on what you mean by yeah, I'm sorry, that's a good question. I, I regret that I wasn't able to bring all my footnotes to the discussion. I didn't know this was the way the discussion was going to proceed, that every sentence I gave in testimony had to be backed up with a footnote. Had these questions been given to me in advance, I would well have been well able to answer that kind of question. I cannot do that this way, then or now. Not to belabor a point, uh, Dr. Chandler, uh, you were asked to provide a list of the material that you were going to be consulting with. Were you not? And in fact, by your own admission, it was 10 days prior to your arrival, and you've indicated to us that since your arrival, you have been boning up and studying uh, the material, including the closing uh, order. Fair to say, nothing would have prevented you for making that list and complying with the court's directive. Isn't that a fact? Yes, I, but as my reading went on, I could, I could easily provide such a document to you prior to maybe tomorrow by going over the stuff I've been reading in my, in my hotel. That list could be, could be the work I've been doing since I've arrived, absolutely. Now, the, um, on the same page later on, right before 10.28.27, uh, you were asked a question. From your research, are you able to say whether all major policies passed in the central or standing committees? And your answer was, which is on the following page, page 27, right above 10.29.04. I can't go to claim my own research. I should note here that I haven't done any primary research on DK since the late 1990s, but evidence has come up since then suggests pretty much positive, a positive answer to your question. And I guess my, aunt, my, my question to you, sir, is you haven't done any research, but then you say that evidence has come up since. Are you referring to the closing order that you read and the material that is cited, which you didn't look at, or are you referring to other academic uh, books that, have my, that might have been written? by other scholars uh, whom you uh, uh, consider knowledgeable in the area, or a combination uh, of both. 
trivia combination. Right. And if I were to ask you to produce this with a list of that, you would, I guess I would get the previous answer. If you want a list of all the things I've read about DK since 1998, I would not be able to provide that tomorrow, but the things I've read in the last couple of weeks that amplified some of my previous reading, yes, I could give you that. Now, on page uh, 38, this is right above 10.1, and there's a question. You were asked if you could explain the relationship between the Central Committee and the Standing Committee, their status, their interrelationship, and in brief, the work that was assigned to each of those committees. Your answer was, I have to say, but that's something I have never studied in detail, so I'd rather not make a statement. As long as an overlap between these two bodies, how they were differentiated is not something I have prepared an answer for today, or I would, I would ready to come back to that if you like, but I'm not ready to give a sensitive answer, a sensitive answer on that. I'm, I'm reading off the, uh, the unofficial transcript, by the way, so I'm, I'm sure the offenses are much more elegant. Now, from your answer, it, it would seem to me that what you're telling us is that throughout your historical Work uh, and what you were focused because obviously uh, the history of the period is rather large and complex and multifaceted. Suffice it to say, from your answer, it would appear that you never studied in any detail or great detail the inner relationship between the Central Committee and the Standing Committee, hence your reservation. Which you can provide an answer to that question. Is that a correct characterization of your answer? If not, please correct me. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I'd like to say I'm sure my prose was just as garbled as you suggest. This is spoken uh, little by little, and uh, I'm not proud of the elegance of some of those answers, that's for sure. Uh, and so when you say, when you say uh, that you would prepare to answer at some other point, can, can I help me out here? You know, can I assume what you're suggesting here is that you could look it up in other texts where others may have written and perhaps even some other material and then provide an informed uh, opinion? Is that what you're suggesting here? Yeah, I'm suggesting I might be able to come to a more informed opinion. Had that been followed through with a request to do so, I would have had it ready today, but it wasn't, so I'm not prepared to do it now. I, I, I'm not being critical, but, su but suffice it to say, suffice it to say, that sort of, uh, if I may use the phrase, on the cuff, uh, review of material uh, to provide uh, a more sensitive sensitive answer is not one that you would consider, or would you, uh, scholarly historical work that one would delve into primary sources and uh, do the analyses and then come up with a conclusion or an assumption. I'm not sure uh, where the question was in that, but I would say uh, certainly that any work I could conduct between two or three days of testimony here with the sources available would be would probably not be satisfactory to me as a scholar, but would be the best I could do under the circumstances. Thank you. And that would be by looking what, what, at what others may have written and perhaps what, might other, what other information might be available. Yes, certainly by other people, because I haven't written about it. Thank you. 
some native one that fake document would land in Saint Helena. And forgive me if I press on. It would be almost like an open book test. Basically, we give you the question. You go to the books. You come up with the answer. 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 You're on us. We're. สาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสาปริญญาสา
22, quote, between 21 and 23 August 1976 at a meeting of the center, not otherwise specified, but probably consisting of a select group of CPK members assembled in Phnom Penh, the party secretary, Pol Pot, spoke at length about the party's four-year plan. So the select group, Professor Chandler, is what you wrote. Now we fast forward to the following page, line 19, and the question is, and within that select, select group, would there have been members of the central or standing committee? And your answer is, well, we think so but have no direct evidence of that, of course. Now you say we. When you say we think so, who is the we? Is that historians in general? Is that the, just the way you've, you've phrased it at the moment? Or is it the co-authors of the text? Because I believe that they're co-editors or co-authors, I guess. Well, the, last, the answer to the last part of your question is all three. I mean, uh, I probably shouldn't have said we, but I think uh, I mean, a consensus would suggest uh, to the higher members of the party, that's probably what it was. Uh, I think that they, none of them were there, with, uh, none of these people was there at this meeting would be inconceivable since these are people charged with uh, actually implementing some of the suggestions being made by the uh, party secretary. Uh, and, and it's not a guess or an assumption that the person addressing the meeting was Paul Pot, if that's what they said it was being addressed by the party secretary. So uh, thank you for that. It was, I was not quite clear which one of the documents you're referring to. And the select group is never defined, so I was not prepared to define it precisely myself. All right. But earlier when you talk about, you said probably, probably consisting of a select group. That was part of the text. So the probably, that's a, a guess or an assumption made on your part, that it wouldn't be just Pol Pot and maybe a few people around him, but there may be some other select group other than a particular uh, committee. Or, I guess well, that's what I'm trying to get at when you say probably consisting of a select group of CPK members assembled in Phnom Penh. That's, a, uh, that's an assumption that you're making. Because obviously there's an announcement to be made about the four-year plan, so am I reading it correctly? Uh, yes, uh, I wish to add there, though this was a published, uh, widely disseminated document, so I can't believe it was a speech delivered to half a dozen people. It was, it was explaining what was going to happen, supposedly, in the next few months in Cambodia to a large group of people, uh, select because it was... Uh, some people weren't asked, but I would imagine, again, sorry for the word, but I don't have the list, that zone and sector people will be brought in here, people, have tried, people with industry, agriculture, those people. Uh, the standing and central committee members would have been, I can't believe that they wouldn't be at the meeting behind uh, their leader who is talking. Uh, so these are assumptions uh, drawn from uh, things such as that the document was not one of the ones uh, discovered in 1979, but was one that was published and, and available in many copies. Thank you. Now, if we go on to uh, another question that you were asked, uh, and this would be on page 41 going to page 42. This is right above uh, 10.58.15. And the question is, you know, I'm starting on line 23. My question is, in the context of these meetings, did the word Anka refer only to Pol Pot, or could it have a wider meaning and include other CPK members as well? And I'll read the most relevant part, or well, I'll read the entire answer uh, for context purposes and for there's no objections. That's an excellent question. It's hard to answer. My first impulse 
Sorry, I, I don't have that document in front of me. I would just need one little bit of clarification. Uh, who, where did the phrase come about of Ankar? Who was talking? Was Pol Pot talking or is it in the title of the piece or what? I'm not sure the context in which the phrase Ankar appears. I think my answer would depend on knowing a little bit more of the context that it was given to me at the time. Well, they, uh, if we go further on, on page 41, this is a further meeting of the standing committee held on the morning of 14 May 1976 with a document number E3-2221. I also recorded the attendance of the three accused ពីមួយហើយកំណត់និយាយអំពីការកត់ត្រាវត្តមានរបស់ជនជាតិផងដែរគឺថានិយាយអំពីព្រមដែនសមុទ្រហើយមុស្តិសង្ខេបដោយអ
Yeah, again, I, I, I don't like to quibble, but I don't think he was considered as Ankar. I think his, his code name was 870. Uh, I think inside the leading uh, apparatus or the head of the machine, as they call it in Cambodia, the Kabbalah uh, Masin, they wouldn't refer to Pol Pot as Ankar. But the country, uh, in the countryside, as I said in another piece of testimony, people were convinced that Ankar was a person of some sort because they couldn't understand that they're being run by a collective leadership that had never happened in Cambodian history before. So the name did blur there, but I don't think in the inside, again, we don't have, I don't have positive proof, but in her circles, I don't think Ying Sri, Kisampan, Nun Chi, whatever, have referred to Pol Pot in private or in a document as the organization. Except in so far as we said earlier, it was the name of a collective decision with, which, which had his approval. So that was the, we are the organization, not him, by himself. Well, okay, now there, there I want to get to your answer. You say, they make a collective decision with his approval. And you, I take it, you're defending your position that it couldn't be a decision made at the top with the others just going along with it, with the imprimatur of the, say, standing committee. You're not prepared to go that far. No, I don't think so. I, no, I'm not. You're right. uh, yes, your question. Okay. So in other words, the standing committee would have sat around to discuss what would happen with Koi Thun. They made a decision, and Pol Pot would say, yes, let's offer him. Let's torture him and uh, get rid of him. Same thing with Von Vett. They would have sat around, with maybe even Von Vett uh, present. They would have voted on it, and then Pol Pot would make a decision. That's how, that, is that how we to, uh, to accept your testimony here today? Your Honor's objection is to use the language. Um, I don't know how it translates into Khmer and French, but the phrase let's often is entirely inappropriate considering that we're dealing with the last of the I'm speaking of Khoi Tung. Let's smash him. Use the terminology that was reportedly used at the time. Are you suggesting that the standing committee, their members, all of them, met, including those who might end up at S21, to make a decision, and then Pol Pot would just make that decision? Is that how we to understand your uh, your testimony, your conclusion? Or do you allow for some other possibility where a group within a group may have made certain decisions at times? With respect, you're becoming the kind of historian you're accusing me of being. You're making imaginary forays into meetings we know nothing about and making assumptions of what was said. Uh, I can't follow along that way. There must have been meetings which we don't know about, where some decisions might well have followed the way you're talking. The evidence of these meetings, we don't have it. The evidence we have suggests that Pol Pot uh, never, uh, I think, jumped ahead of the meeting and said, I don't care what you say, but this is what I'm going to do. He may have done that. We have no idea. This is an imaginary foray, the kind of things you've accused me of two days. Uh, I mean, we can write history together if that's the way you want to do it, but I don't want to write that way. That's my point, Dr. Chandler. <laughs> that's my point. Uh, you're claiming that that's not the way Pol Pot operated, but at the same time, in the same sentence, you say, well, uh, well, perhaps it might have occurred that way. We don't have any evidence. So it would appear that unless you have evidence to the contrary, uh, you're just willing to go along with what you're speculating, which is it must have operated this way and it could operate any other way. This is the way I write, and of course, there might be an earthquake this afternoon. I mean, might is might. I mean, we don't know. When the things we don't know, I use the word might. Uh, let me fast forward, and I'll 
เป็นนุ๊กคือเสร็จแล้วเลนที่แอนเซอร์ซาวูดรีดเดนฮอร์ดเวย์เพลย์อาวูดรีดเดนฮอร์ดเวย์เพลย์อาวูดรีดเดน
approximately 450 pages long. Um, there is a huge amount of material, and the professor should have the benefit of reading his entire answers um, uh, in full and from, from a hard copy or on the screen. If I may briefly respond, we can't have it both ways. You can't allow the prosecutor to act in an adversarial fashion on direct examination and then hold the defense to a civil, uh, civil law tradition where we can only ask open-ended questions on a very limited period of time. If I'm provided with an extra couple of days, I can use that method. I have no objections to giving the gentleman or any witness for that matter the entire transcript. Uh, I, I was under the assumption, and perhaps uh, here's where I need to be corrected, that we were providing on the screen the I thought that that was being uh, done by our case manager. It uh, is not being done. Uh, I truly apologize. apologize. That was my intent is not to mislead. But put it in the context uh, that the prosecutor just put it. The question that I'm interested in is the juridic versus de facto aspect of it. And I think my question was within context. So may the witness be allowed to answer the question? បាទអាមីមីនេះយើងឃើញថាអត់ទង្វើឃើញថាមតិយោបល់ឥឡូវឡើងដោយតំណាងសហប្រជាជនគឺ <coughs> ពិបាកតាមដានដោយសារម្ដងជាពិសារអង់គ្លេសហើយម្ដងជាពិសារខ្មែរម្ដងជាពិសារអង់គ្លេសហើយលោកមេធាវីផ្អែកលើជាពិ
And my apologies if uh, he has not been seeing it on the screen. I, I, I assume that that was, being, that was the case. But uh, if we took a break now, I think I could, uh, uh, we could do that. And I'll, in the meantime, I'll go through my prepared uh, examination and also try to uh, streamline it so that there's no repetition. That's a very good question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, we did start uh, 15 minutes late today, if I could point that out. Uh, I had anticipated going until about, uh, we did our calculations based on two and a half days that were allocated. Uh, at least one of our colleagues did it with some mathematical precision, in fact. And by that calculation, uh, I would have had seven minutes past 12, that is, seven minutes after lunch. Uh, I would be better equipped to answer that question after the break when I go through it. But I, I do think that uh, the rest of the morning, for sure, uh, it would be helpful if I had a half hour into the afternoon session uh, maximum. I think if with that, I could manage. Uh, I, I believe I have until 14.35, I was told. Um, we did our math based on calculating, I think, 12 hours in, I don't know the minutes, over, over a three-day period, you know, two-and-a-half-day period, Monsieur le Président, selon les mêmes calculs qui viennent d'être cités par mon confrère, nous avons jusqu'à demain midi pour procéder à Chandler. Alors maintenant, vous dire si nous allons utiliser la totalité de ce temps, je n'en sais rien, puisque les questions que j'avais l'intention de poser sont posées par les confrères qui me précèdent, bien évidemment, je fais toujours en sorte d'éviter les questions répétitives en éliminant au fur et à mesure que ដែលហើយដល់អាស្រ័យដល់តាមសំណួរដែលគេគំរាមចាំបាន <coughs> បំរងទុកនៅសាក្សីដើម្បីបន្តកិច្ចចំណាការនីតិវិធីនៅក្នុងចុងសប្តាហ៍នេះដើម្បីរៀបចំនៅកិច្ចចំណាការសដាប់